Oh, hello there. Didn't see you there. Line, please. There's nobody else here. Well then. Today we're going to be talking about Indonesia. You know what, I should probably get a script. I think it changed and set up. Hi, welcome back. I don't wear glasses. Today, we will be talking about Indonesia. Now, let's start off by getting into the Indonesian ambiance. So, let's talk about the climate. Now, Indonesia is located near the equator, which means that the temperature is fairly consistent. This average is around 23 to 31 degrees Celsius. But this all depends on your altitude. The lowlands have higher temperatures, while higher up in the mountains um, have colder temperatures. In terms of rainfall, there is a dry season and a rainy season, where the rainy season is around the time that Canada is receiving, uh, is, is enduring the winter season, um, as, and their dry season is during North American summers. Uh, here are some of the measurements. The dry season receives up to 102 centimeters, and the wet season is 368 centimeters. Remember, this is just the average. Some mountainous areas can receive up to 635 centimeters per year. There are some exceptions. Uh, the islands of Maluku and Papua have switched seasons. So their dry season is during our winters and vice versa. Geography and location. So what is Indonesia? Well, it's an archipelago that is composed of 17,000 islands. Mind you, only about um, 600 are inhabited. Now, it is, you can find it between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, two primary sea lanes, um, meaning that their commercial activity is very extensive. Um, it has an area of about 200 kilometers squared, meaning that it's the 15th largest country in the world. Now, Indonesia's geography is pretty consistent no matter which island you go to. It's a chain, uh, it's made up of chains of volcanic mountains. And those mountains are surrounded by tropical, tropical forests and the ocean. So, yeah, a lot of resources there. Culture. Indonesia has a very diversified culture, starting with the language. Um, there are about three main ethnic groups in Indonesia. But if you were to count each distinct ethnicity, like on each island, you'd probably find about 300. Now the first ethnic group is called Hinduized Muslim, and this is composed about, of about 66% of all of Indonesia's population, and, com and includes the largest of the subgroups, Java. The second ethnic group is, is the Islamic coastal people, and this includes um, the subgroups Malay and Makassaris. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, the final ethnic group is the tribal populations, so this is more of the indigenous people of Indonesia and um, other tribes that can be found on many islands. Um, oh, oh, that's the wrong orientation, but I'll read it out to you. Um, there are over 250 languages in Indonesia. Like the 300 distinct ethnicities, they're, um, they are alike, but you could probably count them as different languages. Um, they all converge down into one language called the Bahasa Indonesia, also known as Indonesian, which is the official language of Indonesia. Um, there is also a number of Chinese civilians who have resided there for generations, so that makes up um, a portion of Indonesia's population. Religion. This is pretty straightforward. About 80% of Indonesians are Islamic, and they are influenced by other religions such as Hindu and Buddhism. Population. So again, coming back to the subgroup Java, 
Um, they live on the one of the largest islands, um, which is also named Java, and it is the most populated, accounting for about 50% of Indonesia's total population, um, which is about 100 million people. Um, 100 million people is the population of Indonesia in 1960, so in essence, its population has doubled. It is a developing country, so that means in the past 70 years there have been a lot of um, health improvements and healthcare improvements, and the standard of living has been rising. So that means that the mortality, mortality rate has been decreasing. Um, this results in a overall younger population. So 40% of um, Indonesia is under the age of 15. And their life expectancy consequently increases. So it's about 66 for men and 70 for women. Government. Indonesia is a republic, so everybody has their say in the nation's decisions, which is very good as a developing country. So the People's Consultative Assembly, I guess it's synonymous to Congress for the U.S., um, it, it, they do have the most power, but I don't think that you can really compare them. I'm just trying to make sense of um, this assembly. There's a Supreme Court, which is, um, is pretty good. Okay, let's get to everybody's favorite part, food. Now, again, coming back to Indonesia's strategic placement between the main cultures such as India, China, Taiwan, um, their flavor diversity is extensive and does contain a lot of spices. The staple food for most Indonesians is rice and bread, so you can find that in almost every meal. This is accompanied by a vegetable, fish, and meat dish. But all of this is dependent on the region. Each island has their different type of flavor, and each one has their own spices, grains, or even staple food, but it's usually rice. Um, so this translates into uh, the, the, the diverse flavors that Indonesia has. However, all of them share a certain piquancy, so they all have this spiciness to them. A lot of the food is homegrown, and this is due to the many resources that they have. So the ocean where they can catch fish, the forests where they can grow, uh, where fruits grow, where vegetables can grow. Uh, they also have fields, large fields, where they can grow grains and rice, which is, which is really good for their industry. And one of the most famous Indonesian dishes is called sambal. Um, the spices they make up the dish is the chili, shallots, garlic, and trazi, which is a type of shrimp paste. And this is served with a combination of fish, vegetables, and meat. Whoa, why is it double? So this is sambal. No, oh, double the flavor. Okay, so Indonesia's education. Indonesia's education is fairly extensive, being fourth in the world. However, they're not up there in ranks, they're actually at the bottom. But this is partly due to their history. They cannot put the income that they are getting into the education system, which means that teachers will have to work outside jobs as well. Um, and these teachers, again, are minimally qualified, so this does not translate well into their education system or to the students. And out of the 56 million students that attend uh, primary schools or basic schooling in Indonesia, only about one-third, or 19 million, are able to continue to secondary school. Despite that, 80% of the population can read. So, that's good. Industry. What brings in Indonesia's money? 
Well, their economy is based primarily upon agriculture and product, product manufacturing. Um, let's start off with agriculture. So, the country's staple food, rice, is the leading agricultural export and accounts for about 20% of the total gross domestic product, which is huge. I mean, if, you, if the rice fields burn down, then they, they lose one-fifth of their total GDP in exports. Rubber is also an important export, I couldn't have imagined that. But it is solely grown for the export. This is called a cash crop, where they grow it so that they can sell it and get the income. Other cash crops include tobacco, coffee, tea, copra, and other spices like cloves. The rapid development of timber industry, so um, that's forestry, uh, is introducing Indonesia to sell their fossil fuels, such as natural gas, which makes up 80% of um, energy generation. So um, a lot of this comes from natural gas or oil. They have also started clear cutting, which isn't very good for the environment, so they've just been like cutting away at these trees not plant, replanting them, which is which can be really bad in the future for their industry. The GNP is maturing faster than the population, and the population is growing. It has doubled since 1960, and I find this truly amazing, considering that um, they are a developing country, so this is really good for their industry. The elements of music. So, what you're hearing now... No, no, This is not the right music. Turn on the other first. Oh, sorry. Yes, how hard, hard is it? Oh my gosh. Okay, anyway. Um, the timbre of the instruments. So, what is this music like? What instruments are used to make it? So, what I hear is a lot of percussive instruments. Um, like drums, gongs, and metallophones. There is also a melodious instrument called a bamboo flute to play. Now this type of music is quite mellow, but the percussion instruments do give it a relatively harsh sound. The sounds between the percussion instruments are not as distinct compared to the flute and bells, for example, but you can hear the different sound that each of them plays. The bamboo flute and the metallophones are having a type of musical conversation, as I would call it, uh, where they alternate between them, so one plays while the other one d dies down, and they alternate. So that's pretty unique. So what is its texture? I could describe the texture as a type of collage, where each instrument is playing a different type of melody. It's all blending together with a contrasting effect. The bamboo flute is playing a smooth and connected melody, but periodically plays a jumpy and staccato-like sequence. Metallophones and other background instruments, so most of the percussion instruments, are playing relatively different melodies with different rhythms to create an overall smooth percussive line. This music is quite intricate if you actually think about it. Um, so, what is the rhythm? Or, sorry, the melody. Uh, the melody is very repetitive, yet I think it plays out quite unpredictably. Um, the ranges between the notes are conjunct, so very small. However, it continues in the opposite way than one would expect, so coming back to the unpredictability of this music. It is composed of many short sequences, each with a different pitch and rhythm. The main melody is played by the metallophones, which is joined frequently by the bamboo flute that plays those strange chords. So this kind of... I'm just kind of reiterating what I said about the texture, where, or, sorry, the timbre, where the metallophones and bamboo flutes are having a type of musical conversation. Most of the music is played in a higher pitch. The rhythm. Despite the fast melodies played by certain percussive instruments, the tempo is quite laid back. Using a metronome, I noticed the speed of the instruments to, um, tended to speed up near the end suggesting an inconstant pace. So I would say that it's moderato between 108 and 112. That's what I calculated. 
so dynamics. Indonesian music does not have much of a dynamic range. There are some parts where the flute plays slightly softer, but seldom do the in other instruments stray from a loud dynamic. So I, th I would say that the dynamics range between moderately loud, um, but not really too loud forte. In terms of harmony, um, again, each instrument has its own little melody to blend into one smooth percussive line, but the harmony is distinguishable. It has an overall dissonance. So some things I noticed in this music. Um, there is one point that summarizes all musical elements, and that is the contrast between the percussion instruments. They are all played the same way, each with their own note, with the exception of the metallophone, which has its own melodic phrase. But when they are put together, they can create a unique sound. When the bamboo flute, or another melodious instrument, which we'll talk about later, is introduced, one would expect it to lead the song. However, it simply accompanies the more prominent percussion section. This style of music is called gamelan, which is one of the most popular types of Indonesian music. Evol evolving across two millennia, it has become sophisticated and intricate style, because each instrument has its duty to play. In addition, there are different types of gamelan music, distinguished by its tuning which is what we'll talk about now. So what instruments are in gambling music? Well, first, there is the metallophone. And we heard about this when I was talking about the elements of music. So it's pretty self-explanatory. It is a series of metal bars that are um, that play notes as you strike them with a mallet. Gongs. This is uh, a huge part of the percussion line. Uh, there are several types of gongs that are used in gamelan music and are smaller than traditional Chinese gongs. They look mostly the same, which which makes it even more confusing. But that also makes it more intricate as a musical style. So these are the gong ajang, one of the largest gongs that you'll find in Indonesian music. This is the Bonang, the Kino, the Kitak, and the Kempian. Yes, this is very confusing because they look a lot alike. However, they do not sound the same. So each one has their own note that they play through the length of the song, but when they're put together, it can create a melodic line. Each has their own purpose, which again, makes the music much more sophisticated. So the anklong, another percussion instrument. The anklong is also frequently heard in not only Indonesia, but other South Asian regions. Although the player generally plays one note throughout, there are several others to create the melody. So again, like the gongs, this, this instrument only plays one note, um, but it, does, it can play different octaves, and when they're put together, they can create a melodic line. This is... so... Whoop, here's an image of them. So you strike the tops of these to create sound. Sasando. There are a series of uniquely constructed string instruments. The sando is an example of it. And it also does... and it also takes up its own style. So again, this is like a string instrument. And um, I guess you can compare it to a harp because it's played in them very much the same way. There are strings that come down from the top about here, or right here, you can see that, and all the way to the bottom, each having a different length so that each one has their own pitch. Um, I don't think it's very clear in the image, but when you pluck them, again, it's like a harp, so each one has their own note. Oh, oh, um, forgot to tell you something. This is a type of leaf that helps the acoustics of the sound, which is really, really awesome that they discover that. Occasions. What occasions is this gamelan music played? Well, there are the celebrations, like Indonesian festivals. Um, we'll talk about that later. This is usually accompanied by dancing, um, theater performances, shadow puppet plays, poetry, and drama. So what is the cultural dress? At these occasions, you can find the men wearing batik shirts and taluk best cap suits. 
So the batik shirt is usually worn only on um, Friday prayers at the mosque. So that's the only time you wear it in public. The tuluk best cap. Uh, oh, whoops. It's this, so it's a jacket. Um, it's quite fancy. For the females, so you can find a kebaya and um, the colorful batik sarong. Um, the selendang is kind of like a scarf where you hang it over your shoulder or around your waist. Um, sometimes mothers carry their babies in. Um, I'm not sure how safe that is, but it's fashionable. Okay, so this is the selendang that we were talking about before. And um, this is also the batik sarong. So this is the batik sarong this kind of skirt thing, and this is the colorful shirt that they wear. Oh, Sustaining Indonesian culture. Now the peculiar thing about Indonesian culture is that it's quite new. You see, it is not really receding, and has been, in fact, it has only been about 70 years since they received their independence. The gamelan music is not passed along the generations through textbooks and music um, tech and music class worksheets. It is taught orally, meaning that children learn how to do it, but by trying the techniques that have been used in their families for generations. It is an Indonesian tradition. As a developing country, Indonesia is in its baby years. It helps that it spreads throughout hundreds of islands each one having their own traditions, their own language, and their own type of music. So, as long as they keep that diversity, they'll be able to sustain their culture. There are also isolated tribes that are still following ancient rituals. So, the indigenous tribes that we talked about at the beginning, they still keep up with old rituals. So, they are sustaining Indonesian culture. Um, there are a couple festivals that they have yearly that um, promote Indonesian culture, such as holidays in Jakarta, which is a religious and international holiday, kind of like March break here in North America. The Bali Spirit Festival, which is a festival held every year in Bali, a city in D Indonesia. The Sanur Village Festival, which is a festival to incline tourists to visit Indonesia. The Kuda Carnival which is an event that is held in Indonesia to bring um, Indonesia closer together. So, although it is composed of 17,000 islands, they are still close as a nation, which is, in essence, the whole point of tradition, to celebrate the triumphs against corruption. Indonesia had a very tough start, a very rough start, and they've been able to come through that quite efficiently. I mean, again, their GNP is maturing faster than their population, and their population is increasing quite rapidly. So that is very amazing. And um, over, this, over the course of this project, I didn't really understand how, how amazing this country was, but it actually is really amazing. Somebody get a tissue. Somebody get me a tissue. Okay, tissue. Thank you for joining me through our adventure through Indonesia's culture and diversified music. Um, I'm glad that I was able to learn stuff about this country, and I'm glad I was able to share it with you. Um, here are some citations that I have for the images and the links that I used for my project. So, thanks again. <laughs>